Hi and welcome to Straight Out of Camera, the latest informative photographic podcast for to hit the South African shores. My name is Esli Bassan and with me in studio, I have Managing Editor of TechSmart.co.za, Mike Hubert. Mike, how are you doing, sir? Morning, Esli. Not too bad. Slightly colder than I wanted to be on a March morning, but yeah, good. Thank you. Awesome. Mike, you've had the privilege of um, playing around with Fujifilm's latest medium format camera over the last couple of days. How's that been? Uh, quite interesting, I must say. It, you know, the thing is, there's a couple of things that I've noticed about the camera. Firstly, it's perhaps not as big as you would think. Uh, you're looking at 740 grams for the body, and then with the uh, Fujinon 63mm lens, that's uh, another 405 grams. But keeping in mind, this is a 51.4 megapixel camera with a massive sensor. I mean, it's about four times the size of a regular APS-C sensor. And, uh, you know, it's mirrorless, so I think that's the thing. It's It's manageable. You can take it outside. I don't think it's only meant for the studio. And then, of course, um, you know, the image quality is is there. I actually thought that the, the autofocusing system was quite snappy for yeah, a medium format camera. Exactly, yeah. um, normally, that is literally used in studio, and it's it's more like a set build um, camera. Um, and the Fujifilm really has great autofocus speed. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I notice is it's definitely a Fujifilm camera. You know, you've got basically everything that you find in the uh, X-T2 or the X-Pro2. You've got the uh, the dials for your speed and ISO, your aperture adjustment on the lens. You've got the classic full modes, obviously, and even the uh, little joystick control. That's a very nice addition. So this week, um, we're focusing on action and sports photography. Mike, um, it, this is a very difficult genre to master, I believe, personally. Um, it's dependent on light. Um, I mean, if you take an example of rugby, um, the settings that you're going to use on your camera during the morning will be a lot l different in the afternoon if you're shooting under spray lights. Yeah, for sure. I think one of the things that I've noticed uh, shooting up here north in Johannesburg is when you're shooting rugby, for example, at schools in the morning, you've got that harsh light bouncing off the field and you've actually have to uh, stop down on your f-stop, which unfortunately brings the background slightly more into focus. You know, at night, of course, what counts in digital photography is the fact that you've got really nice ISO these days, which uh, allows you to get your speed up and take those snaps that weren't possible in the past. Uh, I think for people who want to think about uh, rugby photography, definitely schools rugby is, is one thing. Go over the weekend, shoot the sports on the Saturday morning. If you can, try to get uh, access to the Varsity Cup games. That's uh, on Monday m uh, evenings at uh, campus uh, campuses around the world. Uh, sorry, locally. Yeah. International photographers that you think um, has great potential and the image quality is incredible what would, would you reckon as top international photographers well if you're talking about rugby i don't think you can go through this podcast without mentioning vessel wisters and he's the guy um, that was responsible for that amazing photo of frick the prius tackle that's fist against the head with uh, chris laidlaw of new zealand during that all black tour of 97. Uh, wisters has been taking photos now for 50 years he's certainly one of the top South African rugby uh, photographers and seen that way across the world. From New Zealand, you've got Peter Bush. He actually shot alongside Vessel on, on, on many occasions, or sorry, on uh, West Eisen. And then, uh, you know, he's got that great photo of the rugby players emerging from the mist. I'm not sure if you've seen that. We, we had Dave Dutue locally too. Unfortunately, he died in 2015. Amazing photographer. Did not only cover rugby, but a number of the other sports too. But my current favorite is a gentleman by the name of Tom Jenkins. He shoots for The Guardian uh, and he covers all events. I mean, if you're talking about a major sporting event, he's, he's covered it. Uh, not just good for action on the field, really has a keen eye for actually taking uh, photos of the crowd, seeing what they're doing. And he won the recent uh, World Press Photo Award for the best uh, international sport photo. So, yeah. Awesome. All these links of these photographers will be on all our social media channels. You can follow us on Instagram at SOOC underscore live and also on Facebook as SOOC underscore live. You're listening to brandlive.co.za. Leon, how are you doing? I am perfectly fine and sweating in my office. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Leon, uh, I know that you're involved in a number of photo walks down south. Uh, can you perhaps just tell us a couple of quick and easy tips for street photographers to improve their photography? 
Uh, I think a, a good way to do street photography is not to carry too much gear. Uh, that's often the fall down for a lot of people where, where they want to go and not miss a moment, but they end up missing it because they carry too many things and they keep changing lenses and all that. Go with as little as possible and rather observe. I think that is a far better way to, to prime yourself to notice uh, significant little moments that happen everywhere around us. Leon, so this week's genre is action and sports photography, and I know you have lots of knowledge um, on this genre. Um, would you share some of your tips and tricks? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll gladly do so. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting subject because I'm not a sport photographer, but I find it really interesting of uh, the way that people tell stories. Uh, I studied fine art. That's my background. And I find I find the whole way of images coming together in a certain way to tell a story, the, the crux of the matter, doesn't matter what the genre is. So when you have sport and action photography, I think the first thing where, where I start to make sense of things for myself is know the story. If you have the story of the action, then it starts to become a little bit easier to figure out the way that you want to approach it and show action, motion, energy, dynamism, those kind of things that, that make a, a photograph uh, it makes it more dynamic, it makes it more energetic, and it, it feels like you're sucked into the action, even though you're looking at a still two-dimensional thing. Um, that could be sailing or a school gala, motorsport, even wildlife, otherwise known as kids, or war <laughs> photography. And um, I would even put mushrooms growing into action. I'll tell you in a minute why, why I'd say that. Um, it's, it's very unlikely, but it's, it depends on the kind of thing that you find is actionable. Uh, the, the big thing for me is that that mindset and readiness. So if you if you walk around and, and don't think about the the thing that you're going to shoot, you often often miss the the crux of the matter. And in action, it's really about how to how to energize the composition. That there's a whole bunch of different techniques that we could uh, discuss as well. But I think just in short, um, there's a there's a quick joke to maybe an anecdote. To, to explain what this is all about. So the, the snail meets the tortoise and the tortoise asks the snail, listen, do you want a, a lift on my shell? Because I notice I'm going at a slightly faster pace than you are. Uh, the, the snail gets onto the tortoise and the first thing that he says when the tortoise starts to get going is, whee! <laughs> <laughs> so so, so the, the, the point of that is that um, it, it's, it's a relative thing. So the, the, the speed of the tortoise isn't that fast, but the snail experienced it as high action stuff. Um, so when you have mushrooms growing, uh, if you know the BBC Earth series, they've sped up things in stop motion photography. So, and, and with close up lenses, they've actually made an action sequence of something that grows slowly. Uh, if you translate that thinking into the way that you work with sport and actual action, you need to translate a split second of, of a exposure and get people to understand that they are part of that action by looking at the image. And uh, part, of, part of that is when you start to pan and use slow shutter speeds, perhaps. Uh, I think that's one way to go with it. And uh, if you are close to the action uh, with a wide angle lens, you feel more involved so that it feels less, uh, less restricted, more in the action. If you shoot everything with a long lens, it feels like you could be a little bit far away from the action. Uh, the default, I think, for people to do sport photography on a professional level, at least, is to get the, the sharp shot of the rugby player running with a ball or um, scoring a try. But uh, if you want to maybe venture beyond that and get creative, I think a, a different mindset is maybe needed so that you can find different angles, maybe shoot low, uh, shoot from a different place, or get yourself uh, into into the bits where the, where the player's find themselves if you if you set up uh, a camera on the side of the field so that when they run past you don't actually have to be there you can remotely trigger cameras like that now so you are at a low angle whenever they run past you just trigger your camera from elsewhere so uh, basically what you're yep. saying is also you don't always need those long lenses to shoot sports no definitely not no um, in, in fact the the most fun images and the most compelling images that I've been able to make of any action uh, activity is is when I was part of that action in a way. Um, I I was part of a cycling uh, thing with a TED talk two years ago, and and I had a uh, a very light mirrorless camera around my neck. I wouldn't be able to do that with heavy equipment, obviously. So I joined the cycle tour, and wherever we went, I was just happily shooting away because the equipment didn't weigh me down. Uh, but but I was in the action. I was part of the action, and those images were far more compelling than me standing on the side. 
um, just snapping away at people coming past. Good stuff. So this week our photo challenge would be shooting something of the art of action or sports. Um, Leon, I know there are a lot of button presses um, in the... No, no, let's change that. Just click on the word in. Okay, so this week our photo challenge will be obviously of a genre of action and sports photography. Now, Leon, what would you suggest would be this, the quick tips on shutter speed aperture? What are we looking for? Uh, well, if you want to freeze your action uh, in mid-air, let's say you're doing somebody doing a pole vault and you want to get that, that, that effort expression in somebody's face, obviously you need to go for higher shutter speeds and you'll probably end up using a longer lens as well. So you're looking at fast, uh, fast shutter speeds, maybe two thousandth of a second and faster, uh, maybe up to eight thousandth of a second. And uh, that, that will freeze the motion very nicely. But the problem with um, the typical sports mode on cameras is that let's say you have an athletics event, somebody's running and everybody is shot at eight thousandth of a second. It just looks like the eight photo finish hood ornaments all lined up. <laughs> trying to get first place. So the, the way we know that Tom and Jerry are actually running at high pace, or what is it, Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner, they have those streaks behind them. Um, so if you want to maybe do that and use a slow shutter, then you can actually build a little bit more of the drama and the story of, the, of that actionable moment into the image. Brandlive.co.za and all of these images are being tagged on our Instagram page. Uh, follow us on Instagram at SOOC underscore live. Tag us. And then next week, Leon, you will choose the top three um, sort of contestants. And then we'll choose an overall winner. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Leon, what is happening in Cape Town? What are events that we could look out for happening in the next couple of days? Well, uh, the first and foremost, I think uh, the spotlight is firmly on the launch of uh, Fujifilm's medium format camera, the GFX, that was mentioned a bit earlier. Uh, that will be happening on the 15th. There's a day event. Uh, it happens in Long Street at, uh, oh, I've forgotten the Amplified. name of the studio. Ah. Okay, maybe the event, you might be I'll, just, Amplified. I'll just start that, yeah. Uh, the, the day event will be hosted at Amplify Studio. It's a walk-in between 10 and 3. And then in the evening we have uh, in the evening we have an event at the Coal Makeup Studio where we'll be shooting a model with makeup that's done very artistically by SJ Van Sale, and that's a more intimate event. So you can pick and choose which one. Of course, the the studio makeup studio is a bit more limited space. So please email hein.hoog at fujifilm.com uh, with their tagline GFX Evening Launch. And then uh, you will be booking your place for the evening event if you'd like to attend that. Leon. Hello. Have you shot with the, uh, the, the medium format? I have indeed. Uh, it was a It was a whirlwind uh, love affair <laughs> with, with a camera. And I'll tell you, uh, coming from uh, regular full frame cameras and then shooting on Fujifilm with a mirrorless interface, I thought, oh, this is going to be a clunky beast and it's going to operate like my, my previous experiences with medium format cameras where you have one shot per second, maybe it's right slowly to the memory cards, it focuses slowly, one fo focus point in the middle. Everything about that Fujifilm blasted out of the water and the operation is actually so good, it's deceptive. It feels like I'm picking up an X-T2, it's just got a bigger grip and I just carry on where I left off. The, the interface is exactly the same and it's easy to translate. Your muscle memory can... You can set the cameras up so that they are very similar, and I find that very pleasing. But with medium format, obviously, there's a far, far higher chance of getting a shaky shot because there's weight involved and the entire thing is different. So uh, that was a technical learning curve. Now, the, the findings, though, is that it's absolutely staggering. You can even use the GFX for action photography. That's that's my most surprising thing, actually. Leon, but the, the, the difficult part to get over is the Lebola money. I mean, this is a 95,000 Rand camera. Um, I think it's also important for you maybe to, to sort of justify and make the, the listeners understand what they are paying for. <laughs> uh, that's really easy. Once, once you see the image quality, the money doesn't even matter. <laughs> uh, but, but to put it into context, if you look at high-end DSLRs uh, that, that aren't medium format, they're just full frame, which means that they, 
uh, quite a lot smaller and fewer fewer pixels as well, you end up paying more for the top top end flagships uh, of DSLR brands. The other option is going for medium format cameras, which also end up being uh, almost double the price when you start adding lenses. So, so it is affordable. That, it, it is affordable. It's not. It's not that it's outpriced. It's it is very decently priced. I don't think Fujifilm is trying to uh, milk a market for anything like that. That in fact, I think Fujifilm is going to to affect the market to a point where people will sit up and listen, because mirrorless technology is really a professional thing with touchscreen, with Wi-Fi. Things that, that, that a lot of naysayers have been reluctant to accept as professional things about a camera's construction, they're not gimmicky. They're not for entry-level use. This is professional gear with professional image quality. Yeah. It's not a toy. I, I agree. I think you have to kind of determine affordable for whom, meaning this is a professional camera. It's, it's not even for uh, semi-pros. This, is, this goes into the studio. It's behind a certain... Uh, lens. I mean, the lens. I think for the the 63 mil uh, 2.8, it, it's 23,000 rand, 24. Um, so you, you're talking about a specific type of photographer that will buy this, definitely. That's right. Somebody that will be able to understand and extract the quality that the camera offers. Because I'll tell you what, I, I did a couple of shots side by side with the XT2 and the GFX. The image quality is quite on par if you start looking at the JPEGs and just shooting as you would a regular point and shoot style street stuff the moment you start enlarging you yeah. start to notice the differences and where uh, the lines are straight in the way that the, the the tonality renders differently and the acuity of the fine detail from a long distance away that 63 2.8 i was standing on signal hill and i could i could count and even identify which workers on the roof of the cape town stadium had lumo vests on and which ones didn't you wouldn't be able to pick that up with irregular SLRs and, and uh, crop sensor cameras. The, the information just isn't enough. Okay, so now with the affordability of a camera and obviously being a more pro-orientated camera, um, it will most definitely, if you were shooting in a landscape sort of genre or a fashion photography style or even weddings, that will definitely, you'll be a game changer. Absolutely. And I think in, in that perspective, that's definitely a completely different beast altogether. It, it starts to introduce a, a new section into the photography market. I think it, it doesn't necessarily have any direct competitors for me uh, because every, everybody else producing wedding images have a particular look and medium format is a, is a different thing. It produces images that, that have a different rendering. The bokeh is different because of the, the sensor size. The depth of field, obviously, you can ex ex extrapolate far more information out of that, out of group photographs. And I, I did a, a quick test at a friend of mine's 40th birthday last weekend. And I was very pleasantly surprised at the dynamic range and the amount of detail that it retained five stops both ways of, of a normal exposure. So that allows quite a lot different uh, usage when you shoot weddings. Uh, even, even regular functions and portrait photography in studio, when you shoot products and all that kind of thing, it, it makes it a very portable, very easy to operate high-end professional uh, equipment that, that I've been aching for, for for years and years now, and I'm really glad that it's arrived. Yes, 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 who got brands talking. Brandlive.co.za Have you ever thought about the power of social media? Social media has the power to make your business grow. Grow! Why don't you let us manage your social media? Because our business is to see your business grow. Visit us at www.beastownmedia.co.za. Leon, one of the things that not bothers me but uh, I think will open up debate again is the fact that if you had a look at the medium format film cameras of the olden days and then this new one obviously on the digital side there's something about film that still sticks around in my brain that maybe you know there's a certain type of rendering or there's a certain type of look and feel to the film photos coming out of medium format that's perhaps slightly different than digital what's your opinion 
Uh, you're addressing two different things in the same in the same breath. There, the first thing uh, with film photography, obviously, is the the natural growth of crystals um, on film as the film develops, and that has that's called grain, or in digital terms, it's called noise. So Fujifilm has really done very well to do their film simulations to to look a lot like film that we know and love. Um, and if you haven't started to love film yet, it's a good idea to purchase some and shake it up in the darkroom. Uh, and you'll notice that the, that the grain structure, noise structure, is very similar. Fujifilm has done very, very well with that. Uh, where it is different, in, uh, and I agree with you, that is uh, that film, especially when you're shooting medium format, if you've come maybe from 617, Fujifilm has done those as well. And, and everybody knows the other brands when you t take a look at um, things like uh, Hasselblad and whatever the things. That, those are square 6 by 6 or 6x7, 6x17, that, that's a large format where it's uh, the 645 sensor even uh, is bigger. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm just going to repeat that. The, the 645 surface area is bigger than the 50 megapixel sensor that we have. So when, when you do look at bokeh rendering and the way that the uh, image looks, it, it has to do with a film grain, but it also has to do with the way that the image is structured based on the size of the the sensor or the film plane and that that is simply i think the thing that people try to simulate when they have a look of it's a shooting a 50 millimeter on a regular full frame wide open at 1.4 that has a particular look and people want to simulate that look in medium format where it's it's not really the similar kind of a thing having said that though i think when we when we see the introduction into the market of the 110 mil f2 that the gfx will have that's going to change once again good stuff thank you Okay, so next we're talking to Tom Wilman. Now, Tom is a very well-known uh, photographer in the South African scene, extremely knowledgeable about his uh, field and equipment, and he has shot basically everything from Prince Andrew through to a number of local celebs to sporting events, such as the Isle of Man TT race. What I personally like him is a, his documentary style he brings to, the, uh, to his wedding photography. But for me, the, the best thing about Tim is definitely the fact that he counts Tony Hawk as a friend. Tim, welcome. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you very much. That's quite a cool introduction there. Tim, uh, tell us a little bit about action photography. You, I know you're big on skateboarding. You're a skateboarder yourself. A couple of quick hints and tips in regards to shutter speed and, and how, to, how people can actually get into some action photography. Right. So I, yes, you're right. I've been skateboarding for about 30 years now. So I feel I have an unfair advantage in approaching the subject matter. And that's what I really want to talk about is something Leon brought up as well which is understanding your subject. Uh, stuff like skateboarding, BMXing, surfing has a big culture following behind it, and you need to understand that culture a little bit too to be able to get a good action shot. It also depends on, on where and when you'll be shooting. A lot of the times you want to get the highest shutter speed possible. You want to freeze the action. You want to make sure there's no blur. So boards flipping around, um, somebody ollieing or doing a flip downstairs. You want everything as crisp as possible. The beauty of, of skateboard, BMX and surf photography is that it allows you to shoot in a very artistic way. You can play around a lot with your settings, you can blur very creatively. There is a lot of room for that sort of photography in the market. Sure. Uh, you know, one of the things that they said about uh, Vessel Westhuizen is that he almost had a sixth sense in regards to where the next shot mm -hmm. is going to be in regards to rugby photography. Do you kind of uh, think that growing up as a skateboarder you kind of know the same thing? Where's the next shot going to be? What's the next move? Absolutely. I think knowing the sport, knowing what a trick look like, looks like, how the board's going to move in the air, how the skater's going to move, that helps you to anticipate the moment. Something a lot of people don't realize is that you can't just aim a camera at a skateboarder doing a trick, put the camera on burst and think you're going to get the shot. Because a lot of times the movement is so quick, the action is so slight that you'll miss it between fra from frame to frame you'll miss the shot you, you can shoot at 10 12 14 frames a second and there's still a chance it won't be perfect you have to be able to anticipate the shot and that translates very well from skateboarding to other forms of action photography is that once you have realized that you need to understand the sport and to understand the motion to be able to anticipate the moment that helps you so much when you go and learn a new field of photography because if i had to for example go and shoot cricket or rugby even though I know a little bit about the game, I have to become very, very familiar with it to be to start to understand when to shoot the photo and when to anticipate something. I've heard the same being said about wildlife photography, that you do need to understand the animals. 
learn their behavior and tips and you know see where they're going to be next to anticipate that when you're talking about putting your camera in burst mode how do you shoot do you prefer three shots at a, in a second or um okay so first of all i agree with you about the the wildlife photography you have to understand animals intimately to be able to know what's going to come along what they're going to do next and it helps with your wedding photography too i'm quite sure absolutely <laughs> absolutely See, the thing is, with, with actual photography, you have to love whatever you're photographing. Like with weddings and documentary photography, you have to love people. And with wildlife photography, you have to love animals and be very, very, very patient. And then what? a couple of your own ways of shooting? Yes, yeah, so I, I tend not to shoot burst a whole lot because I prefer to understand the trick and to anticipate the moment and to shoot for that. Uh, a good example to give is with BMXing, even though I've grown up with... BMXs at skate parks and, and street skating and stuff like that, I don't always know exactly how a BMX trick is going to look. So a guy will have to describe it to me. No. I need the, the bike caught at this point. That's where the trick looks good. My arm needs to be straight or the bike needs to be at this angle. And then that's what I'm going to be looking for. And it's that anticipation that, um, that, I, that you learn after you learn from hours and hours and hours of practice. I think you're, you're quite true because on the, a couple of shots that I've done, I've definitely seen that it really matters where that hand is or where that foot is or where that is. It's like the small little differences that can make or break the shot. That's correct. There's a very famous example of the team manager for Dogtown Skateboards and he actually would tell the guys, no, you need to put your hand like this or put your hand like that because it looked more stylish. I've actually done it a few times myself where I've said to the skateboarder, you know what, the trick looks fantastic, this looks amazing, but drop your hand a bit lower there or just do certain things differently mm -hmm. in the trick. You don't want to have a hand blocking a person's face. I think in all these action sports what's key for me my, in, in my opinion is always being able to see the person's eyes or at least one eye because we get into strange angles and we shoot fish eyes and we lie under handrails and things like that and for me personally I always want to see a person's eyes so that I can connect with them and so yes that hand in the face or foot in the face and blocking a person out that's something you do want to watch and want to avoid can I drop the bomb go on artificial light or natural light so it all depends. Um, a lot of street skating is done at night and you will use artificial lights, big LEDs or big flashes and that. A lot of the time as well with street skating you want to show the environment as natural as possible so you'll shoot natural and available light for a lot of it. For me the bottom line is as long as I can get a sharp image, if I can get that sharp image in daylight and there's enough light bouncing around, for example at a skate park which is built, made mostly of concrete, there's so much light bouncing around you very rarely have to have lights set up. But even so in, in broad daylight if you're not getting the shutter speed you need then definitely lights. Leon you've got a question for Tim. Yeah um, on, on the matter of selecting gear and everything you mentioned flashes and all that, uh, have you played with uh, high speed sync as well in broad daylight to to, to underexpose available light and create a different effect like that? Absolutely. I think the one thing I haven't been able to do is play with really, 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 really big monster lights, which can turn you know daylight into nighttime when you want to underexpose. But high-speed sync, definitely, especially shooting a very wide lens, like a fisheye lens, because a lot of flashes lose power when shooting high-speed sync, so you have to get the flashes quite close to your subject to freeze it. But I absolutely love high speed sync if the if the situation calls for it one mm -hmm. other thing one other thing if i can just point out very quickly is that i mentioned before about being creative with the lighting and being creative with skateboard and bmx photography you can use first and second curtain flash in a lot of different instances so for most of the photography i would rely on second curtain flash i want the subject frozen at the end of the trick but what's where you can be quite creative is to shoot first curtain flash freeze the image and then have a huge beautiful blur coming after it. This allows you to use a very slow shutter speed and a lower ISO but then gives you that artistic feel to an image where the skateboard is frozen at the exact moment you want them to be but then afterwards there's this beautiful blur moving out of the image as he lands the trick or so on. Leon I think that's what you talked about a little bit earlier you know not just showing these uh, freeze frame images to bring in a little bit of yes. uh, effort to show a uh, movement. Right and uh uh, on, a, on another thing is I know that uh, the cameras that we use are now capable of shooting high frame rates should we call for it and very big images those need to write to memory cards uh, do you find that you prefer certain memory cards over others 
I've, I've, I've experienced the UHS-2 that the Fujifilm cameras are now uh, building into the, the card readers inside the cameras are far superior and it helps dump images onto the cards uh, far, far quicker. Have you had the same experience? So I have to say that my key thing in shooting bursts and, and high frame rates would be to capture a sequence, so to tell a story in an image. So for example, a skateboarder comes up to a wall flips the board, lands on the wall, slides, and then flips off. And I need about three or four seconds to capture that. So what's crucial for me is the buffer and the camera need to be able to cope with that first. And mm-hmm. then it flush, when it flushes out onto the card, that that's only a secondary concern, really. My main concern is that initial buffer because I'm not going to be shooting burst after burst after burst after burst. It's going to be a burst, and then I'm going to have enough time to write to the card. So to be perfectly honest, I haven't really pushed that to the limit in which, I, in which I'm testing how quickly a card can flush. But I can definitely say that with the mirrorless cameras I'm using now, uh, the buffers are definitely big enough to give me the, that three to four second range to capture a whole story, to capture a whole sequence of a trick. Cool, cool. And then continue shooting uh, and continue sort of focus. This is something that I'm going to do a lot more of in future. I have most of my skateboarding, BMXing, that sort of stuff, I've got a wide lens or even if it's a long lens it's locked off and pre-focused and I'm not going to be tracking a person into a shot especially with the with the wide angle lenses they're pre-focused set to infinity there's more than enough depth of field and I know I've got the person sharp however if I'm shooting action like motorcycle racing for example then definitely tracking focus is going to be key to use for that sort of thing you want to be able to track subject into the image and grab the photo at exactly the moment you want to and the best way to do that is to track them in I've also heard the story that uh, skateboard photography is not always the safest type of photography. And uh, you've had a couple <laughs> of incidents where you actually bled for your art. Yes, this does happen. <laughs> um, I've, well, one of the best ones to talk about would be at the Maloof Money Cup, which happened a few years ago in Kimberley. International skateboarders came out. They were riding what we call the mini mega ramp. So you're dropping in a ramp that's about six stories high. You air over a gap and then he hit I think it was a 20 foot quarter pipe and as the guy went up into the air he came off the board him and the board disconnected and he was going to fall but I, uh, on the big vert ramps the guys have big puffy knee pads and they just knee slide out of it and they're fine but I didn't pay attention to where his board was and I looked down at my camera straight away I did the cardinal sin of chimping didn't look where the board was and it clipped me on the head and gave me six stitches if people want to get into skateboard photography where, how? So to be true to my roots, I should say the best way to get in skateboard photography is get a skateboard yourself and ride it. However, that could be a very painful process for a lot of people. It would be for me. Yes. Yeah, so, sure. so what I would recommend is, is get, look, there's so much to look at online now. We used to pick up magazines or look at videos and to see what other professionals were doing. So I would suggest going online, going to something like um, Thrasher magazine, look at the skateboard mag, See the angles that those photographers are using. You'll be able to figure out the lighting pretty well. Where um, with skateboard photography, people aren't very shy of of showing shadows on walls. So if somebody's doing a trick down a handrail, and you got a big light on him, and you can show his shadow behind him. That's quite an artistic shot. That works. But that is the bottom line: is get to know the sport, get to know a bit of the culture. If you go to a skate park and you're 50 years old and you're wearing sandals and you don't look like a skateboarder or if you approach the skateboarders there and say to them listen I'd love to take some photos of you is that okay 99 times out of 100 the kids are going to be fine with it they'll love it they, they understand there's a whole culture that they understand where they know they need to get photos and video out to promote themselves mm-hmm. so that would be the best bet is to you know, just to approach just understand what you're looking for what you're trying to get understand a bit about the sport and then show respect for it. Go to the skate park, show respect for it, say, guys, I'd like to take photos. And that often is the easiest way, and it works, like I said, 99 times out of 100, the kids will be very stoked to have a photo taken. Lens choices? <sighs> Long lens and fisheye. So anything over an 85 equivalent on 35mm film, so anything over 85, uh, 70 to 200 equivalent on a mirrorless, a 50 to 140, otherwise it's fisheye. The in-betweens, you do get shots you could use a 50 mil on or a 35 mil, but most of the stuff you'll see in a magazine is very long lens or fisheye. Good stuff. Sorry, can I chip in there quickly? Yeah. Um, 
this just back on the thing of flash while you were talking you mentioned um big light and being able to freeze that and downplay available light quite a lot in midday light um, I'm not sure if you've had time to play with any of the X100 cameras yet, but they have a leaf shutter, which means that you can synchronize your flash at any of the mechanical shutter speeds up to four thousandth of a second, which means that a, a simple thing like one off-camera hot shoe strobe can can light a big scene with only a quarter power, and you can still shoot at f2. Um, have, you, have you had a chance to play with that? Because I think that, that would be amazing for skateboarding. I have I have played with it. But it's funny that this question ties in with the previous question so nicely because on those leaf cameras the lens is a fixed 23 mil or 35 mil equivalent and it's a funny it's a funny focal length to use and to use well for a lot of skateboard and bmx stuff it's not one that i've personally used very often i have experimented with it and that is amazing and that does help freeze action at very very high speeds but it's just the fact that, that leaf shutter is sitting in a camera that doesn't have the widest lens that i would like to shoot uh -huh. with Tim, now we know, obviously, you as one of the best action photographers South Africa has to offer, but other genres that you shoot, can you just maybe give us a little bit of background of who is Tim Mulman and what does he do for a living? So at the age of 30, while working in IT, I was uh, head hunted by a company and taken overseas to the UK, and I ended up on the Isle of Man. I've always liked art, but I can't draw and I can't paint. So I decided I'm going to teach myself photography. So I arrived in the Isle of Man with a two megapixel camera and started to teach myself photography. It was a perfect storm of all the right things happening at the right time. I was made redundant. I had to get a horrible part-time job in order to stay in the country. And during that year, I shot and shot and shot, bought a new camera and shot, bought another new camera, which was my first DSLR. And within a year and a half, I had a portfolio together where I pitched it to a company on the island and started working for them as a trainee photographer. What this meant was I was sitting in-house with professionals who had been doing this for 30, 35 years, and I literally stood on the shoulders of giants. I was extremely enthusiastic, which is what I think what got me the job, and I was really, really, really eager to learn, and I was in the right environment because by the end of the first year, Working in-house as one of their photographers, I had shot the Out of Man TT. I shot the Manx Grand Prix, which runs on the same circuit. I photographed weddings. I photographed schools. I did studio work. I learned how to light a studio. I did so, so many different things. Um, I'm incredibly, incredibly fortunate to have learned the way I did because I taught myself the basics. I got thrown into a, a very, very busy photographic environment and was taught to photograph a variety of things. Um, we we've obviously seen your your Instagram feed and we saw some images of Comedy Central. Um, can you share some of the, the funny stories about that event? So that's uh, one of the first commercial events I did after switching to mirrorless. And what I loved about the mirrorless cameras, besides their size and that, is how cool they look. And one thing that's changed for me in the last year a lot, which I might speak a bit more about now, now is that I've only used a 35 mil and an 85 mil focal length for a whole year of photography. I've just gone off zoom lenses. I found a brilliant uh, fisheye lens made by Sam Young, which I've used. But basically, cool looking cameras, small cameras, not a lot of zoom lenses. And I arrived at the Comedy Central Festival with these two tiny cameras, second shooting for another guy. And every celebrity that stopped that I stopped in the red carpets to get a photo of. I was like, man, it's a cool looking camera. Are you shooting film? They were just so surprised by these beautiful, tiny looking, classic looking cameras that I was shooting with. And I absolutely loved it. It was so much fun. I even gave my camera to um, one of our local comedians, Wackett Simpson, and said, hey, take some photos from the red carpet. And I got photographs from the red carpet looking outwards, which no other photographer got, which I find amazing. And that would never have happened if I, get, if I had a big DSLR around my neck. These cool looking mirrorless cameras to give him like a, a Fuji X-T1 at the time and say, hey, take a look at this and have take a few photos. That was, yeah, that was quite an experience. I loved that. Just a couple of words on your wedding photography, perhaps. You, you've got a very specific style and it seems like you kind of want the story behind the, the, mm. the wedding. Is that something that you've mastered over the years? What inspired that? So over the years, I've shot a few events as a photojournalist. Um, I really enjoy travel and documentary style photography. And this now has influenced my wedding photography a lot and the switch to mirrorless. The two went hand in hand because I mentioned before that I'm shooting a 35mm equivalent 
and an 85 equivalent on a 30 on 35 mil film and sometimes a fisheye but those two prime lenses on small bodies has changed everything for me i move through a wedding quietly i always ask ahead of time what the dress code is so i can dress like a guest so i can blend in with everybody and often people don't even realize that you're the professional because you're walking around these tiny dinky cameras taking photos they're silent if you want them to be you can switch them to electronic shutter they make no noise and it's just changed the whole approach for me i absolutely love them i love the fact that i can walk around the whole day with two pouches on my belt on my waist and two cameras running around, hanging around my neck and i don't get tired whereas with dslrs i had big zoom lenses i used a lot more flash than i use now it was a completely different game one of the things that I've heard uh, documentary photographers uh, say in the past when they were still shooting film was that uh, there were some photographers that would uh, tape their camera completely black with duct tape just to make it less of an intimidating factor when going to shoot people in a strange place. So what I love about the, the mirrors cameras I'm using now, the Fujis, is they are small, they're indistinct, they're quiet cameras, they're not loud, they don't shout. DSLR, the lenses are smaller, they like little black boxes taking images and I love that. It's more about, it's not about the gear, it's more about getting great photographs. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Can I maybe uh, reply to that as well? Okay. Leon, please go ahead. Um, in my experience, this is exactly the same, uh, but with wedding photography, oftentimes I find people expect a big camera to rock up to a show because then... Uh, th then I don't have a name anymore, then I'm just the photographer. And since I've been shooting on mirrorless, especially the more retro design of the Fuji cameras and, and the way that the lenses are smaller, everything, it's a, it's a tinier thing, I start to blend in like Tim said as well. But the expressions that I get is very different. The reactions that I get from people are more honest and they're more relaxed. They don't feel like they need to pose or, or run away from something. They, they just they, they come over as far more natural and in the moment without them being disturbed. I feel I need to add something there as well to the documentary photography question with, at weddings. And it's a case of you're allowing people to live the day and enjoy the day themselves as the way they want to do it. You're not stopping the day. You're not saying we need to go and do this. We need to go and do that now. I found that my style has evolved using these small mirrorless cameras because I can just let things happen in front of me and it doesn't disturb anybody. It doesn't bother anybody like Leon says. It's just, it's a game changer for me. It really is. It's like I've given up the jackhammer and somebody's given me a paintbrush now to create with. That's what I love about mm -hmm. the Fujis. Tim, another events that you've covered? Yeah. Um, so I've been a full-time professional photographer for, it's my 14th or 15th year now. I think it's my 14th year. I've been very, very fortunate. Like I said, look, the Art of Man TT I covered for six years while I lived there and that is one of the most incredible, incredible racing events that you're ever likely to see in the world because it takes place on public roads. One lap is about 60 kilometers long. They do four to six laps. So unlike a Grand Prix where you get so many more chances to photograph guys coming around a corner with Isle of Man TT, if you want some variety, you're only going to get one chance at a certain position on a certain corner in that. And that was an amazing event to cover. I've covered um, dance festivals like Ultra. I've covered stuff like the cycle challenge up here in Johannesburg and the, the 702 walk the talk so so many different things I've really had a, I've been very very fortunate in the variety of things I've had to photograph and and memorable moments that you can sort of look back to in 20 30 years from now so photographing events like the TT are incredibly memorable memorable because of the, the the kind of event it is but one that stands out for me especially because I've been skateboarding for so long is um, I saw on the Tony Hawk's Twitter feed that he was coming to South Africa a few years ago and I took a chance and I tweeted him and he said, uh, sure, let's go for a skate. And I ended up skateboarding and taking photographs of Tony Hawk one afternoon and we've stayed in touch since then. And that was quite an amazing event. And I must say, it was one that I didn't take enough photographs at. I was just too excited to be skateboarding with Tony Hawk that I, I think I took about eight photos the whole afternoon. Um, in advice on gear? Can I split this and say advice on gear and on photography? And sure. and what I want to say is that, um, look, horses for courses. Whatever gear suits you best, suits you best. I think you should always keep an open mind to new gear that arrives and to always keep an, an open mind to what the latest changes in the photographic industry are because even though we're so advanced in digital photography, DSLRs are still using the old film bodies, the old size and scope and feel whereas the mirrorless cameras are coming in now they are lighter and smaller 
and the technology is astounding that's built into them. So don't get too fixated on gear in the sense that um, it's the only thing you're chasing because you need to be taking good photographs. You don't need to be chasing gear. A great photographer can pick up a mobile phone, take amazing, amazing photographs because he sees light in the correct way. Brandlive.co.za I want to just mention one thing about photographic advice I'd love to give, and that is while you're going to be always looking at the right gear and the best gear to get for yourself that suits you, like I just said, that is something that's, that I feel is key. I found the mirrorless has changed a lot of things for me. But my favorite piece of photography advice to offer somebody is to bend your knees. When I say bend your knees, I mean find a different angle, find a different approach, find a different way of looking at things. You're going to look at magazines and there's Instagram and Twitter and Facebook pages. You're going to look at thousands and thousands of photographs. Try to find something that makes your photographs stand out and makes them different. And the easiest way to do that is to bend your knees. Climb a tree, lie down in the gutter, find a different angle that makes your photograph stand out. Tim Wilmon, where can people get hold of you? You can find me on, get your pens ready, uh, timwilmon.co.za is my commercial work. Timwilmonphoto.com is my wedding work. Uh, on Instagram, I'm Tim Woman Photo or Tim Woman Weddings. And on Twitter, I'm Tim Woman Photo. And you can see there's a pattern here. <laughs> and on Facebook, I'm under Tim Woman Photography. Leon Westhuizen, the same for you, please. Uh, yeah, I get distracted by many accounts. So I'm Leon Westhuizen everywhere or Leon's Lens. So that's my website, leonslens.com. Or Leon Westhuizen on Instagram. Uh, you'll find me very easily there. Drop me a mail, like my stuff. Leon, can you perhaps tell us a little bit more about the photo challenge that's being organized? Yes, the photo challenge is very simple. Uh, we have a weekly challenge on our podcast, and that means that for the week to come, I'll be looking at all the images that are posted on Instagram with a hashtag SOOC underscore live and picking the best ones, and we'll have a finalist. There's kudos at the moment, and hopefully if this gets traction, we can organize some prizes in the future. Let's see how that happens. The first uh, theme for the month or for the week? The first theme is action, and with uh, SOC straight out of camera, the ideal is to shoot the moment, not manicure it later on. So if you can uh, tag SOC and try and be honest about the images that you get straight from your camera, that'll be awesome. Okay, and these are, camera, uh, these are photos that's just straight out of camera, nothing added no editing done is that correct that is correct that is that's the fun of getting out and shooting instead of being a mouse jockey and I, i'd like to see a, a little bit of people challenging themselves and making something interesting in the moment rather than in the computer good stuff okay. yes 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 who got brands talking brandlive.co.za Just remember, for a photo challenge, um, which Leon will obviously give us the three um, main contestants and then the final winner, uh, you have to go on our Instagram page and tag us at SOOC underscore live. For the photographic challenge, please remember to tag us on Instagram at SOOC underscore live. Gentlemen, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is an Thank you so much. Appreciate incredible it. Time. It's our first episode, and hope for a lot to come. Thank you, Mike. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Thank Italy. you, guys.